This episode is sponsored by Full Bucket Veterinary Strength Supplements. Use promo code CHATFIELDS to receive 20% off your first order from Full Bucket Veterinary Strength Supplements. Welcome to Chats with the Chatfield. This is a podcast to expand your idea of what impacts veterinarians, pet owners, and basically all animal lovers in the galaxy as humans. We are your hosts. I'm Dr. Jen the Vet. And I'm Dr. Jason. And if you have not yet subscribed to our show, why not? Just go to chatfieldshow.com and subscribe today. And if you want to reach us and you've got a message that's full of love and positivity, you can find me at Jen at chatfieldshow.com. But for all other questions, that those of you guys that want to keep it real, you can reach me at Jason at chatfieldshow.com. I don't know why you roll your eyes every time I say that. Okay. I that- like the real message. It's not about fluffy unicorns and rainbows all the time. Okay. Especially it, about today's topic. It could be, it could be, I know, but today's topic is so fun. So yep. we're going to jump into it folks. So this is for our horse loving friends, our infectious disease uh, connoisseurs. Um, let's see who, who else is this? Well, really any, anyone who that, lives in that anywhere. covers everybody in the world, right? I Doesn't think so. Everybody in the world. I think yeah. it does. Ninety-nine point nine percent of people see a horse and go, "Oh, that's so awesome!" Right? I mean, yeah. yeah. Hello. So, right. so we are going to talk about um, a little bit of horse medicine today, but don't worry, don't worry, companion animal friends. I'm gonna bring you. I'm gonna bring it to you. Don't worry. So, our guest in the chat room today is none other than Dr. Rob Franklin. Now. I will say we have two facts about Dr. Franklin that we need to know, need you to know before we get into it. Number one, he is a board certified equine internist, right? That means he does internal medicine in horses, which I find to be one of the most challenging aspects of horse medicine. What do you think, Jason? Internal medicine, surgery? Internal medicine followed by anything is challenging, right? It is. So, uh, it is. Espe- for me, especially horses, right? I'm one of those guys. Yeah. Oh, look, so pretty, nice to run around. I don't, you know. Yeah. Horses yeah. are great as long as I'm looking at them, right? I know. I'll be completely lost. So. I know. So I'm really excited because also he's worked with some of the um, foremost authorities on this disease of interest today. It's called EPM. It's equine protozoal myelitis. I think he'll correct me if that's wrong. I just say EPM. But the the second fact about him that we need to know is that he actually is one of the founders of our sponsor, Full Bucket. But he's not going to be talking about that today, which is why it's not hinky, right? We're we're going to be focused on EPM. That was more of a full disclosure situation than it. True, it is a fact. Full disclosure, moving on. We try to be transparent and direct here in the chat room. Okay, so without any further carrying on and shenanigans, let's welcome Dr. Franklin into the chat room. Dr. Franklin, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Dr. Jen and Dr. Jason. Of course, of course. You're probably sitting there going like, like you, you started the introduction like 25 minutes ago, Jen. You're probably like, ah, ah. Look. Now is it my turn? Now is it my turn? That's really funny. Well, because yes. it's going to be his turn for most of this, right? right. Because... We got to get we got to get something in while we can, right? That's true. It's true. Good point. It's true. So, um, so I actually got an I got an email from a friend of mine <clears throat> because she had found out some information about her horse. Well, one of her horses, an EPM, and she says to me, "Hey, Jen, what what do you know about EPM?" And I said, mm-hmm. "It's spelled with three letters." <laughs> And I thought, wait, but I know a guy and I know a a lot of horse owners struggle with EPM. Uh, So can you tell us um, like what is EPM? Yeah. And there, and thanks for the, uh, the lead up Jen. And it's such a, uh, it's such a wide open um, topic because there is, uh, I'm going to preface it there's a lot that we don't know. And uh, this disease was was first described um, back in sort of the late 60s, um, 1970. It was reported at some scientific meetings um, in the mid 70s. And so it's it's been around for a while, um, you know, 50 plus years that we've acknowledged it. Um, but, um, you know, we, we've been doing a lot of research and we're, we still have you know, many more questions than answers. So um, it, it's quite easy for people to get on their stump and, and, and talk about EPM and be, um, 
very anecdotal in their in their mm-hmm. information. And I think a lot of horse owners get that too around the barn. Yeah. Uh, oh, they, around they, the barn. Jason, are you on a stump around the barn? Always. I like to get up on my stump and, and scream and holler. I think that was the best thing so far. Yes. Like, good for people to get up on their stump and, and share stories of EPM. That's what we That's do right. on Saturday afternoons. That's right. Okay. So, but, but, but for, for folks, for the uninitiated, um, so e- EPM, equine protozoal myelitis affects horses, obviously, because equine is in there and uh, protozoal. Even, even I was able to figure that out, Dr. Jen, but I appreciate that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Pr- protozoal, uh, that's a parasite, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yep. So, and it, and the myelitis or, or also referred to as myeloencephalitis, it, it has a predisposition for the spinal cord, but it does occasionally uh, cause problems in the brain. Um, it likes the brain stem. So it likes the central nervous system. Um, it is a protozoa. So it's called uh, Sarcosis neurona. That's mm-hmm. the scientific name for the protozoa. There's also um, another protozoa that's probably responsible for a very small number of cases called Neospora usi. And those, um, those two uh, affect the horse. The horse is, 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 is a dead end host. That means it's not part of the normal life cycle for this protozoa. Um, the normal life cycle oscillates with Sarcosis neurona oscillates between the opossum. And that um, that's where the uh, infectious part of the, uh, of the life cycle comes out. So basically the, the intestine of the possum allows a replication for this and then it's um, eliminated in the feces. And so okay. those feces are spread all around. Okay. 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 So I heard a lot of stuff in there that, that could be quite <laughs> useful to me if I had a horse. Right. So I hear sarcosystis neurona and we don't need to say that anymore. Right. That's the parasite. Okay. That's the fancy name for the parasite sarcosystis. I, I, I don't know. I like to say it. I sound, that's, you like you to know, say it. I sound smart. So I might, fancy. I might bust it in. Yeah. It's even okay. More all right. When you say it backwards. Yep. Well, <laughs> you're right. We're not trying that. <laughs> no. Okay. So, so for our bird loving friends out there, you might be saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've heard of that. Sarcosis neurona is also something that affects citizen birds like parrots and macaws and causes very similar things, right? Sarcosis can cause all kinds of neurological problems in birds. Okay. So now we have birds and horses affected by the same parasite. And you mentioned possums. So possums are the reservoir. Are they the source of it? What like do we know? Yeah, they're, so they're the source of it. Um, definitely. There's, and, and there's several different sarcosystis. Um, in, in there was uh, early days, you know, we, we weren't sure which one of these sarcosis were causing the disease. So um, we started chasing down a lot of these, what we call intermediate hosts, which, mm-hmm. you know, birds can be. Um, and, and we, we were attributing disease related to those intermediate hosts. And are they, you know, part of the, the problem that we need to address? Mm-hmm. Uh, it turns out that, that many of these sarcosists um, that affect birds, you know, aren't in the same life cycle as the one that affects horses. So uh, for example, Falcatula was, was a, the species of one that uh, resulted in the demise of many brown headed cowbirds, uh, mm-hmm. which are, you know, there's tons of those birds around, but right. people thought they were part of the life cycle. So they right. just started distinguishing them around right. horse barns. Yeah. That turns out not to be the case, but right. um, so the definitive host is the possum, the intermediate host for, um, for our parasite mm-hmm. is going to include things like the armadillo, the skunk, the raccoon, and even the domestic cat. So what happens with those is they get exposed to the, uh, the feces uh, from the possum that has the infectious organism in it. Mm-hmm. They ingest that. And then it, likes to go into their muscle and develop these cysts in their muscle. Ultimately, when they die, they're scavenged upon by guess who the, uh, the possum. And here we go with the, the life cycle, just sort of, you know, completing itself, the possum ingests the infected muscle and then the cysts come alive. And then they start replicating in the possum's feces and the possum just goes spreading it around. Now the horse jumps into that life cycle again, as kind of an, aberrant host or, or dead end. Dead end. Host. Dead end. I like that phrase. I like that phrase. <laughs> dead end. You're done. There, there's no, there's no sexual replication of the protozoa in the horse. So the horse can't infect another horse 
Um, it, they can't uh, cause infections to skunks or, or possums or anybody else. It's, it just ends with them. And, and sometimes that ends, you know, truly by the end of the, the horse's life, but in mm-hmm. most cases not. So, but, okay. But that horse is, is so, not a normal life cycle. So, and you skipped over one word there because that becomes important. Um, you said there's no sexual replication of the parasite while it's in the horse, which is why the horse is a dead end for the parasite, right? right? So right. parasite gets in the horse and it doesn't replicate in such a way that it can be passed on by the horse. So right. you don't need to uh, get rid of a horse that has it because he's no threat to anybody else, right? Correct. Um, so tell your horses not to, not to discriminate. They can hang out with, <laughs> with horses who have, who have EPM. It's really okay. Um, but then, um, that like calls into question, I guess. So this one thing I think that's unique about, um, sarcocystis is that it has sexual and asexual replication, right? So it can adapt to any circumstance that it wants to. Um, and it has so many of these opportunities with the intermediate hosts that can continue to pass it on all of which seem to live in pastures and around barns. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a little bit scary. Uh, yeah. So while everyone, um, heads out to, to uh, start counting the raccoons and possums around their barn. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about what does EPM look like in your horse and what might you be able to do about it to prevent it? All right, hang on. We'll be right back. With all the fuss happening in the pet food industry, why not invest in something to help guard against digestive health derangements in your pet? Full Buckets probiotics are formulated by veterinarians to support your pet's normal digestive health. Your pet's gut microbiome is integral to their immune system performance. Why not add Full Bucket's daily dog or daily cat probiotic powder to your pet's daily routine to curate, protect, maintain, and strengthen your pet's microbiome? Visit FullBucketHealth.com today to check out all of their veterinary strength supplements. Oh, right quick, let's do this. These View from Vet School, brought to you by the AVMA Trust. Veterinarian-inspired coverage protecting you through it all. Greetings, Chatterboxes and viewers. I am coming to you fresh off of finishing my first semester at vet school. And let me tell you that after what seems like an eternity and definitely the longest semester of my life, I am ready for a nice, long break. It has been 22 weeks, 22 exams, 17 quizzes, six finals, and a partridge in a pear tree. Which brings us to the topic of this V's view. Take a breath and a break. Now and then, whether you are in vet school or any school, working hard or just managing your life and family, take the time to take a break now and then. Now understand, sometimes in life, we wind ourselves so tight that it may take a couple of days to fully decompress and relax, but it is worth it. Whether it's the long or the short term. Hell, when I was working in law enforcement, I had to work midnights for a rotation and it took me two years to sleep right again. That being said, it will probably take some time to adjust when returning to vet school as it does most of us when we return from vacation to our normal everyday routine. But again, worth it, do it. Thanks for listening. I'm V. That's my view. Want to share your view? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Or do you have a question about vet school? Send it to me at info at chatfieldshow.com. V's View from Vet School, brought to you by the AVMA Trust. Veterinarian-inspired coverage protecting you through it all. Okay, back in the chat room, we are going hot and heavy with a bunch of science um, all about EPM in horses. And for those of you listening, um, sarcocystis is the infective agent or, and or neospora um, can, can also be the, uh, the cause. But these two parasites are similar to one that we see in small animals, right, Dr. Franklin? 
Well, you answer the small animal people. Um, <laughs> so I'll let you take over there. Well, yeah, because are, aren't these similar to, to toxoplasmosis, toxoplasma gondii, right? It's a it's a protozoal. It has the right, same. Yep. The whole thing sounded super similar, different, different names, but similar, similar, similar life cycle, similar stuff. Yeah. yeah so, all that stuff. Yeah. So for, for our audience who doesn't have horses, a lot of what we're talking about, you can apply with Toxo, not all of it, but a lot of it um, can be applied to Toxo and uh, dogs, cats, and humans as well. Uh, so, okay. So we talked about the possum, you said skunks, raccoons, um, I think I have one question. I have one question about yeah. that really quick before we delve even further. So, so can you clarify that the, the, the opossum, the raccoon, all those things, they don't, they're not going to have signs. They just carry this, this bad boy around. Is that what happens? So they don't, they just kind of, you know, breed it in, in, internally and then, and then, and then send it on its way. They don't, they don't necessarily show any of the signs that you're going to see in horses. Or yeah, clear, clearly not the possum. Um, right. Who, who's going to be the one that's going to be the definitive host, but the intermediate host, you know, that the, the sarcosis in the muscle could theoretically, you know, cause some demise of those animals. But, gotcha. but typically those are just going to accumulate cysts in the right. muscle. Mm-hmm. And then of course that muscle is going to be the thing that the possum feeds on whenever gotcha. that animal dies. Mm-hmm. So not re- they don't get the neurological forms that we're seeing with the horse. Okay. I just wanted to, I thought, so I just wanted yep. to clarify that. No, that's a good point. But but um, but it is a good idea to keep those pests and varmints out of your barn, also, right? Like because they oh, can. It, it's they crucial. Can... <laughs> it's crucial. I mean, that, we'll talk about prevention. Yeah. But that's going to be one of the the most important things. Yeah, hundred percent. It's crucial. It's crucial. Okay. Crucial. Yeah. So uh, all right. So my horse gets it because they are exposed to infected possum feces. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I guess a horse. Yeah, they have to be exposed. The only the, that's why the possum is the definitive host. They're the only ones that can transmit the infection, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So while the skunks, the the dillos, and the uh, the coons and the cats, I mean, they they're part of the livestock, but they can't, you know, cat poop uh, can't can't cause an infection in the horse. But what they can do in the population when you have those animals is they're basically giving um, more opportunity for the possum to. Uh, get a hold of right. the stark assist and to amplify the the numbers of parasites in the environment. Okay. So uh, that's interesting. Yeah. First um, we should give a shout out to all the parasitologists for figuring this kind of stuff out. Oh, I always, yeah. I'm always, I'm, I'm always amazed by it. Right. It's just, it's just truly, crazy. truly. So, yeah, especially with that um, intermediate host thrown in there. I feel like that's a little bit of cheating on the part of the parasite. Yeah, it's super, super cheating, right? It's not yeah. right. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, so. here you go. So, okay. So, uh, so if you see your horse eating possum feces, um, like we should look out for signs. What, like, what is a horse, and I think this is probably one of the biggest <clears throat> questions that I hear from my friends that have horses, um, because while I might play one on a podcast, I'm not an equine vet. Um, why? What, what are we looking out for? Like, what will my horse do or look like if they have EPM? Right. And and uh, just to clarify, so that the, the possum feces may get may enter into that that animal's um, system by contaminated water, contaminated yep. feed, contaminated hay, any of those things allow that opportunity. Now, once that, that horse takes it in, like we talked about, it has a predisposition to go into the central nervous system. So, okay. you know, there are typical signs and then there's a whole cadre of signs that, you know, we just say could be EPM. Right. Uh, the most classic <laughs> ones. Like, again, so- I, it's like Toxo and some other animals is kind of the same. Is it, like, is it like mad cow? Like remember Denny Crane on Boston Legal? Yeah. Like he did, he was just like, I've got the mad cow. Anything that went wrong is like, <laughs> any, the mad any, cow. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. okay. Sort of so, like nowadays, it, but yeah, I mean, it can, yeah. it, it has some very classic signs, but it also, um, yeah, I mean, you could, a lot of people will say their horse looks EPM ish and that, that can mean anything. Is that, um, a thing? So the cla- is that really <laughs> a thing? EPM ish? Oh, is it a that thing? And, and many other um, similar <laughs> contrived words to describe a horse that's not performing exactly how the owner wishes. So, Oh, um, it's a performance issue. It it can be. And and I'm not discounting the fact that it doesn't occur, um, Sure, but, but in its classic presentation, when it was first described and and how we always um, think about 
it is a uh, unilateral, meaning one side, it'll affect uh-huh. one side of the, the body. And that typically will result in a loss of, uh, of muscle. So a classic would be the gluteal muscle um, in, the, in the right hind limb and the horse just begins to evaporate. So they get atrophy of that muscle. Right. And they, they may also get some coordination issues on that side as well. So when we talk about one-sided coordination, coordination issues, uh-huh. or lack of muscle, muscle uh-huh. atrophy, that is, you know, you, you, you put EPM really high on your list. Now, when okay. it affects the brainstem, it affects some of those nerves that go into uh, and around the head. Uh-huh. Then we may see some focal atrophy of the muscle, the chewing muscles, could be the temporalis muscles. We may even see uh, some facial nerve issues uh, in there. And so those, again, unilateral signs are are very classic for EPM. Mm-hmm. When, they, when we start looking at bilateral signs or things that are equal, whether it be coordination or lack of muscle, um, inability to chew on both sides, that brings in a whole nother list of differential diagnoses, but the, the unilateral or, or um, you know, problems are classic EPM. So that's like a dent in your horse. It can't be. It can I mean, look very similar to a dent in your horse. I mean, that, I mean, that's what muscle atrophy looks like to me, especially if it's a exactly. horse. Exactly. Like with a giant, I like horse with a giant back end because that's what they use for stopping. Um, so I like them be able to stop really well. And right. if there's a dent in the back end, man, that's EPM. Wow. Right? That is EPM issue. And it, you know, it all of it all matters where that where that protozoa goes in that spinal cord. And if it mm-hmm. gets close to a nerve root that that basically goes out to innervate a muscle, and that's where you get that muscle atrophy. If it just occurs in the long tracks that that relay the signal of where our feet are and how hard to push and everything, yeah. and those just result in coordination issues. So it can be both, can be one, can be the other. Okay. And that's why EPM can look like a whole host of things. And when that, those signs are really subtle, that's mm-hmm. when we get performance issues. So when we're doing sports medicine exams on performance horses, you know, we're typically looking at lameness issues uh, mm-hmm. in the joints. We're looking at wind issues in the throat or the lungs. We're looking at heart issues, but oftentimes we'll get these really subtle performance issues um, where the horse just for a barrel horse, it just kicks out around a turn or, mm-hmm. or a dressage horse just makes an occasional stumble or something. Um, that's when we say, well, it could be something neurologic and EPM is going to be high on that list. So that's a clumsy horse, right? Like if they trip, if, you know, if they trip pretty often. Like if you're just like, Oh no, that horse trips, like his cadence is, is, uh, it's got a regular trip in it. Then we're thinking, and it's the same foot every time. Eh, maybe, maybe a little EPM ish, maybe EPM ish. There you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it, it can be, you know, and they can do you, that you for made a variety fun of, that of reasons, but it certainly comes onto our list when we yeah. see weird things like that, but the classic ones are the classic ones. And I think we have recognized those for a long time, but it's, um, there, there has been sort of a, a line that I think we, we cross often, and that is throwing everything in to be EPM. Mm-hmm. And I think that can be a catch all for the horse just doesn't perform very well because yeah. it naturally is not that good of an athlete or mm-hmm. the training's not that good or the rider's not that good. And so sometimes before the horse gets retired or rehomed or put into a new trainer's barn, it gets treated for EPM. So, Ooh. okay. So that, then we get to, so we get to the thing here. I'm like, so I know like for other protozoal infections, right? Like toxo in a lot of different animals, macropods, uh, lemurs, people, cats, testing is like equivocal at best, right? Like we can do all kinds of tests and what do we know? We know we did all kinds of tests. Like we don't necessarily have an answer. Is it the same situation for EPM in horses? Is there a definitive test that says, yes, your horse has it or no, they don't. Uh, Short answer is no, there is not a definitive test and testing is a quagmire at best. Um, (laughs) It's a quagmire. If you're playing bingo, there's quagmire. (laughs) Yeah. Was that, was that one of your buzzwords? Someone get a prize? No, but sometimes we try to work in some interesting phrases. So, so EPM is a testing quagmire. Okay. But what are the options? Cause what that usually means to me is that there's like 10 different choices. Right. So um, in its most basic form, uh, we might do 
serology, which basically says we're going to pull a blood sample and has your horse uh, developed antibodies to this protozoa, this parasite. Uh, and if it has, you know, sometimes we'll say, well, that's supportive of a diagnosis, but a diagnosis for EPM is a clinical diagnosis supported with adjunctive laboratory testing. And sometimes it's a process of elimination as well, because it can look like so many different things. Mm -hmm. It can look like musculoskeletal problems related to lameness. It can look like several other infectious or non-infectious neurological problems. So sometimes those are easier to rule out. And what you're left with is EPM, especially in those more subtle cases. Again, those those uh, more classical cases, mm -hmm. um, oftentimes we're not even running the test. So yeah. if you if you need to go down the testing pathway, uh, sort of the best test and not a gold standard. The only gold standard is is a post mortem, which um, oh. that's not a good. That's, that's not less a good than test. ideal. Less not than a good go to test. No, no <laughs> not a good go to test. No. Um, but if you're if you're trying to do a pre mortem uh, diagnosis, then probably the best thing is to to look at both a blood and a cerebrospinal fluid or CSF fluid uh, sample and comparing those. And, mm -hmm. and there you're looking for um, antibody differences in the spinal fluid. Uh, and sometimes even you're looking for the, the antigen itself with the PCR test. But again, those can be very hit or miss, you know, up to 90% of the horses in North America have seroprevalence or are seropositive for EPM. So well, that, again, that's, wow. yeah, that's, that's what I was just going to, yeah, that's what I was just going to ask though, because most horses are pastured or they're, even if they're in a barn, the, the barn has, can have possums in it. Um, <laughs> and so don't they all have an antibody titer because they've been exposed, right? Right. I mean, it's, it's anywhere from 15 to 90%. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and where people really go and get misled is whenever they want to do a screening. So mm -hmm. say you're doing a pre-purchase exam right. and right. You know, you're doing all these things to make sure you're getting a healthy horse and people say, well, I want to do an EPM test too. Not really. Um, because that's mm -hmm. not going to give you any information, um, that this is going to be useful. In fact, it could, just, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like doing a Lyme's test, you know, it, it can just, mm -hmm. it can make the situation very, very yeah. muddy, uh, muddy, yeah. muddy, yeah. muddy, 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 yeah. muddy, muddy, uh, right? So it's muddy. It's, is this a progressive disease? We may have gone over this. Is it, does this disease, does a horse, is it going to get progressively no, worse? It, Jason, it's conservative. Oh, very good. Okay. <laughs> I, just want, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, it's more of a green problem. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm kidding. That's a great question, Jason. It, it is. Uh, and the answer is yes and yes and yes. Um, so it can be acute. Um, you can have a horse that is just chewing, uh, eating his food normally. And then the next day, it's literally got one side of its face and wow. food's falling out. That um, quick, overnight. Wow. Huh? Overnight, um, you can get more subtle, um, you know, I'll say escalating problems. So they and then you can get some chronic problems that just sort of are low grade, but they don't tend to escalate. So um, the answer to your question, Jason, is yes. Uh, well, that all that wasn't around. very it, helpful it at all. In so many ways. All and right, people that, think that, that it can't come on overnight. It can knock a horse down that make it where yeah. it can't stand up overnight. Wow. Wow. Not helpful at all. No, all right? not helpful. All right. We're so, looking for some helpful answers here. I know. So here, because then I guess, um, so the, the testing, I understand, right? Like, because it's, it's possums that are going to bring it to my horse. Basically I can't, you can't eliminate possums, right? You just, I mean, well, you could try. Well, but. Yeah. I mean, you should, you should try, um, mm -hmm. either through, you know, live trap. I mean, live traps, let's just leave it at that. Um, it, but trying but to get those possums, trying to secure your feed, uh, storage area, right. Yeah. Uh, keep your water source clean. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, if you've got a barn, you need to be trapping those boogers. Mm -hmm. and a lot of times people are putting out cat food, feeding, you know, barn cats and stuff. And all kinds of stuff. Yeah. you know, you're calling mm -hmm. in all possums when you do that. So <laughs> yeah, you, you've got to be, you've got to try to mitigate that risk because mm -hmm. it is, it is the number one thing that you can do to try to uh, prevent your horse from getting EPM is to control the possum. But it's a fool's errand to think that you're going to keep your horse from being exposed by keeping all the possums out. You should. You should make great effort for many other reasons, including EPM, to keep varmints out of your feed and out of your horse stall and whatever. But if you put yep. that horse on a pasture, 
um, depending on the size of the pasture, I guess, um, it's a fool's errand to think that they're not going to potentially be exposed at some point. Right. It's like, it's like saying that you're keeping your dog from being exposed to parvo. No, it's everywhere. Right. right? Or, or, or your, you know, your, your macropod, your kangaroo from being exposed to toxo. Mm, it's, it's everywhere. All right, Dr. Chen, you're, you're what? correct. It's everywhere. Well, let's not throw our hands up and go, Oh my gosh, don't even no, try. No, right? I'm just, I think I'm just saying, like, you got to try but, to mitigate it. I think you, it, it is everywhere, but I mean, really when we start feeding animals in a concentrated source, that's right. where we, we amplify the amount of, of protozoa in the environment. And that's right. what we get. Most of these horses are developing it that are in barns, not yeah. out on, on big pastures or ranches or something like that. It, yeah. You know, it's just a dilutional issue whenever mm-hmm. you're out on that, those big properties. But when you're in a barn and there's, and there's a feed tub and that, that possum's in there pooping in the feed tub. I mean, you've just, that's the problem. Thrown a, a, a whole bunch of, of parasite in that horse's <laughs> environment. Right. Well, I mean, but feeding, putting, just leaving food out is never a good plan anyway. Right. Like that creates an unnatural population density of all kinds of things. Yep. Um, So, and if you're, if your horse is going to eat it, then you should protect it. Like you protect your food, right. Keep the lid on, you know, uh, preserve it appropriately. So we don't get rot, all those sorts of things. So uh, now if, if I think my horse has it, we do a test which doesn't really tell me too we much. We may or may not do a test. Right. Yeah. Right. But, but, um, but oftentimes we'll do a test to support a clinical diagnosis. Sure. I will say this. I mean, I've had some, some horses that, uh, and it, this is few and far between, but it's definitely happened that have been zero negative. So negative to antibodies on a blood test yeah. with per acute infection. Right. Mm-hmm. So they, they just probably, uh, hadn't had the chance to get those circulating antibodies yet, mm-hmm. but, but they, you know, responded and classic, classic symptoms and they responded well to treatment. Well, that's what I was so getting at. Like what, how do a blood what do test we do? can be nothing. It can go both ways, but yeah. oftentimes we'll do it just to help support our clinical su- suspicion. And if it is negative, that will more than more than likely rule out the disease, but I always keep it on my list, especially if the signs are classical. Okay. So then what are we going to do? What are we looking at for treatment? Because he did um, say respond he, to treatment. Right? He did. So you're telling me there's a chance, right? right. Here's what I got out of that, right? <laughs> One in a million. <laughs> One in a million. <laughs> no, 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 not that bad, right? No. Yeah. Not so, so yeah. So, so what are we, what are we treating with? Because I think there's a few choices on the market, right? Um, how long do we treat? And if it was subtle changes, like a tripping horse with negative test results. How do I know when I've treated enough, I guess? So Man, all that. You just know how to tee up some good questions, Jeff. I mean, Those, <laughs> shit, there's like nine questions in that one little But thing. they're all perfect. And they're, <laughs> I mean, they're ones that we wrestle with. So let's talk first yeah. about what's available. And I'll say there's a bunch of stuff available. And anytime there's a bunch of stuff available, that means that nothing is the, is the gold standard and right. works all the time, right? Right. That, otherwise, and that so would people, be that's a, the treatment. That's a good point, right? <laughs> right. And people throw a lot of, a lot of, you know, quasi treatments in there. And again, you know, half the time, not say half the time that, that may, that's not accurate, but a lot of the time, you know, we don't even have the right diagnosis or people are just mm-hmm. treating. I say people, even lay people just go out and say, well, my horse looks at EPM mission. So they'll just start using stuff of course. and then the horse gets better. And the horse really had a, a foot bruise, right. you know, and that's <laughs> yeah. the reason he was tripping and they gave some, you yeah. know, X, Y, Z. And then they said yes. that worked. And that's how all, a lot of that stuff gets going. Yeah. But let's talk Saturday about the night at the barn. <laughs> <laughs> I treated my horse with this and it saved the day. Yeah. Oh anyways. man. Yeah. Oh man. And, and I added in some DMSO, so I know it worked. <laughs> we know that <laughs> we call that veterinary ketchup, right? It goes yes! with everything. Yes. Yeah, okay. So. But we're, I mean, okay, we're, jo- so we're joking, the, but go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So the real, the real deal. So the FDA stuff, that means it's gone through some rigor and been approved by the FDA. There, there are three options that are out there and uh, two of them are in the same class of drug and one's called, um, uh, Marquis and that's panazaril. Mm-hmm. And then you also got its cousin, which is diclazaril. And mm-hmm. that comes in a pellet version, um, uh, called protozil. Um, what about toltrazaril? Cause I'm seeing that now too, like a compounded toltrazaril. Well, and then you can open up that whole Pandora's box of all the compounded <laughs> stuff that's available. Right. Okay. And so those are all triazine derivative, uh, anti and, and they, they all work the same way. 
And quite honestly, they're all about equally af- effective in, in okay. treatment. So um, the thing with, uh, you know, I'll always put a caution out there with the compounding is that it doesn't have the same rigor in terms of making sure that uh, you've got the right concentration in every batch, like an FDA approved product. I so mean, I let's recommend people. Let's remember the polo horses with Frank's pharmacy right. and the compounding oh, error and totally. dead horses, right? So be, dead horses, be yeah. get a credible be compounding right. pharmacy that's well, going to create and that even, for you. And you're exactly right with that Frank's pharmacy. I remember that. Um, but, but even since then there's, there's been EPM there's, meds that have gotten screwed up and yeah. horses oh. have died. Oh. Um, so wow. I, and I'm not saying that that's not appropriate in some cases and sure. sometimes some nice combinations are put together, but just to save money is not the right reason to use a compounded drug. Um, but so the, those, those triazine derivatives, punazaril, diclazaril, uh, Toltrazeril, they're mm-hmm. all metabolized in the same active uh, thing. And, yeah. and so, and they all work on the same way. So, okay. Uh, and they're all pretty bioavailable, meaning when you give it to them, they, they get absorbed uh, pretty readily through the intestinal tract. So it's not a difficult, uh, difficult type of treatment where some of those treatments, you know, you just mm-hmm. can't get good enough concentrations. Is there, in is there something fiber. that we should feed the horse at the same time? I mean, you know, when you're feeding a horse medication, like we, like people like me, I like mix, mix it with sugar, or molasses, or whatever, but is there something different, better, or what should we, how should we do that? Add some full bucket in there. Get some probiotics. <laughs> 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 we can say that now because we had a full disclaimer. Otherwise that's right. we'd be like, oh, shameless. That's right. Yeah. Well, uh, in all round of the, the third, the third one and in, in the, the thing that we started using the earliest was, mm-hmm. um, a sulfadiazine pyrimethamine combination. And that is okay. now, and that was used in a compounded version forever because we didn't have an FDA approved product. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now that's called rebalance. And, and so that's an oral liquid that you, that you give to those horses. Mm-hmm. Um, at the same time, to, to, there are some things that can help um, that, you know, there's a thought that they're there. Well, when we do research, um, so when I was a resident at University of Florida, I, I did my research um, looking at this particular protozoa and looking at it in a, in a specific type of mouse model, because we were looking for a prevention, something you could feed daily on yeah. uh, these horses right. that were high risk and that would knock down those uh, chances of getting infection. Mm-hmm. And so we were feeding them panazaril to these uh-huh. mice and they're called gamma interferon knockout mice. You, you yep. all are probably <laughs> familiar with those, but they basically, they've, they've taken out a gene in their immune system. Uh, and so their immune system can't fight off these types of, uh, of disease. Now, if you don't take out that, that gene in a mouse, they, they won't become infected. And so it, there's clear that there's an immuno uh, compromise situation. Now, there have been some studies done looking at older horses and horses undergoing physiologic stress that do show that maybe they're a little more uh, prone to infection. But there are also some studies where we try to suppress the immune system with things like cortisone, uh-huh. um, exogenous cortisone, and it didn't really change their their likelihood of getting infected. But all that to say that there probably is something to do with the immune system that's gone awry that allows some horses to become infected when 90% of the horses Others that don't. are exposed don't right. get infected. And we need to go back to that is there, the incidence of disease is, is 1% or less in terms of the total population. So 90% wow. up to 90% have been exposed, less than 1% actually get the disease. So there's a huge so disparity. You got to be really a special horse. <laughs> to, a special horse to get I mean, yeah. yeah but there's okay. enough horses that uh some of them are going to be special that's true that's true <laughs> but if, but when so you what, said physiological stress so mm-hmm. i mean i don't know like what horse is that like the horse that scared the boogeyman's around the bush because that's physiological stress or do you mean like physiological stress like getting them in a trailer and hauling them somewhere or i mean what are you talking about Yep. And, and all the above. So you take a really herd bound horse and you isolate them. It's totally going to be a lot of stress, but I am, I am largely talking about hauling a horse to horse shows or horse races or the, the, the physiologic stress that occurs in an intense training situation. Uh So any of those things can increase circulating cortisol, which suppresses the immune system. And, you know, people think stress is just mental stress that we get from, from our work, but you know, stress is real. Mm -hmm. Stress is real and and it has consequences in the animals. So what we're trying to do with some of these ancillary things is support the immune system. Okay. So you said, what else can I feed? Oh, that's why you Um, meant probiotics. 
right? Like I, that's, I why you, and, you, that's why you mentioned that. The probiotics that. and prebiotics are two things that really do support the immune system. Over 70% mm -hmm. of our immune system is in our gut. Yes, it's it is. The, it's the big pool filter that, that, that collects things and, and tells the body what to fight off and not fight off. So, uh, probiotics and prebiotics definitely keep that in tip top shape. So that would be something. There's also some, uh, some medications that have been used to help, uh, stimulate the immune system, things like levamisole, mm -hmm. which is a dewormer that's been shown to increase the immune system. Uh, we also have some, uh, some, some things that, uh, stimulate the immune system that are parenteral shots. So, mm -hmm. uh, Equistem, Equimune, those are, those are yep. injections that veterinarians will give to try to stimulate the immune system. So we'll, we'll try to do that, but in large part, those things are, uh, those are the key medications that we use. And then it, it's notable that, um, you know, you said, how long do you treat them for? There's not a prescribed dose. We treat them until they're, they're, no longer have clinical signs. Now, sometimes that never changes. So their signs mm -hmm. uh, just may get static at a point, And then I may stop treatment at that point. But if I am getting improvement, I'm going to treat until those patients are completely um, as good as they're going to get. And typically I'm going to give it 30 days, you know, of static before I say it's, it's not getting better. And so a lot of times like a, a, a marquee, which is the panazeral mm -hmm. paste, that typically is given for 30 days. And now mm -hmm. if the patient is uh, halfway better and improving, I'm going to continue to give that. The, the older drug, the sulfidizing pyrimethamine, that works in a different way. And yep. we typically have to give that longer, three to six months. Yep. And so you have to, and sometimes I'll combine those because they work in different ways. And if one horse isn't responding, I may uh, I may put them on both to try to attack mm -hmm. that parasite in two different ways. So you're saying it's not the end of the world if your veterinarian comes and says, yes, you're not only is your horse EPM-ish, I, I actually think that might be the, the issue here. You're saying it's hopefully it's not necessarily, it's a bad diagnosis, but it's not going to be, hopefully not going to be the end of the world because you do see some improvement. Right. And just generically speaking, most of the studies show about two thirds of the horses are going to are going to respond positively. And that means a third of them are not going to respond. And that can be a third may not respond to marquee, but that third does show some response to rebalance. And so um, again, we'll, we'll try a different approaches. Yeah. Um, yeah. But out of those two thirds that, that, that respond, that doesn't mean that they're all cured. That means that 100%, they right, may yeah. return to normal, right. but that also could mean that a positive would be them, um, stopping the disease where it is mm -hmm. and realizing that sometimes the nervous system just gets damaged where those, uh, where those things were asexually multiplying, they create yeah. damage in there. Yep. And that it sometimes doesn't go Can't away. Can't recover from that. Yeah. 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 Or, or it takes longer. I mean, it can take a it long can. time for the nervous system to repair itself. So if yeah. I have a horse though, like what, you know, what if I'm a, I have a performance horse, right? What if I'm a barrel racer and you know, it's rodeo season and, and we're, you know, hauling that horse all over the place. Or what if I'm a polo player or a Fox hunter, or, you know, I'm doing stuff. Cause that's one reason people have horses, right? Cause they like mm -hmm. to go do stuff with them. So how, I mean, can I prevent, can I decrease the likelihood um, that might, cause people are always asking me like, what can you put, what can you give them when you're trailering them to sort of mitigate that physiological stress? And I think you've already touched on some of it with the pre and probiotics, um, and other immune support, um, uh, items, but is, you know, uh, can we give one of these Azarils, um, while we're trailering them or is that not helpful? No, no, that it is. And, and so, uh, you know, Again, 20 years ago, the research that I did uh, did show a positive effect whenever you gave low dose daily panazeril to these gamma interferon knockout Ooh. mice. And that's been iterated and proved mm -hmm. and expanded upon uh, into some true clinical studies, and which do show uh, a reduction of disease incidence whenever we keep these animals on low dose um, diclazeril uh, pellets, for example. Um, and, and so it can work. Now you would want to have a fairly high risk animal to do that. It's not okay. inexpensive yeah. um, to do. Yeah. Cause I'm pretty uh, sure, I'm pretty sure all of these are laced with gold, man. Th I mean, they're they very expensive to treat a 1200 pound creature. <laughs> and, and, you know, Jen, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I talked about how, uh, difficult the testing is, but sometimes we use treatment as a test. And yeah. I know you guys are familiar with that and other species, but we'll, we'll oftentimes say, okay, look, we've tried to rule out the other things. 
um, mm -hmm. let's treat for EPM and see if we get some resolution. And especially mm -hmm. in those more subtle performance related things, that can be a, a very useful tool uh, looking for that, that improvement there. But yeah, I mean, you, you in, but it's expensive and a lot of times mm -hmm. that's why people go to compounding and unrightfully mm -hmm. so. And, um, but in, in good horses, yes, to answer your question, I would be protecting my immune system. Uh, again, I'm going to go back to uh, reducing the number of varmints in the vicinity. So securing your feed and your water and mm -hmm. making sure they're, they're kept clean, keeping, uh, you know, wh where you're feeding the barn cats, making sure possums aren't getting in there. And, uh, and just trying to reduce the, the, I just always think it's a bad idea to, to say, well, we're going to try to stimulate the immune system, but I'm not going to try to reduce the dose because EPM, you know, we say, why are 1% clinical and 90% are exposed? Right. It's probably dose related as much as anything. So oh, yeah. system, overwhelming yes. exposure, right? Like, right. 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 Mm -hmm. So, so how do you reduce the dose? I mean, it's, it, it's not by keeping the immune system tip top. It's about reducing the exposure <laughs> to the parasite. And I mean, so, can you not just disinfect your pastures monthly? Come on, people. Come on, what just doing? throw it all out and start over. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just difficult, I'm but I mean, useful, yeah, no. right? I mean, they, yeah. those are useful things to be doing. Um, and then, you know, consult with your veterinarian about low dose, um, you know, daily feeding or intermittent feeding of these, um, mm -hmm. uh, panazeril, diclazeril type of medications because they, they can be effective. And uh, let's face it, you've got a, a, a horse that is going places and you've got oh, a yeah. lot invested in time and money. Um, it, even though it's expensive, it's not that expensive compared to the de debilitation the that can occur if the horse gets yeah. the disease. The, well, the, yeah, the loss. I mean, you just got to weigh that, that cost benefit, um, uh, balance out. So, um, I, and I guess, I guess that's where, uh, part of me also starts to wonder about, um, re parasite resistance. Um, so do we run the risk of developing that or is that not, um, you know, a large issue with these protozoa or, I it, mean, it could be, um, it's not documented right now, but, uh, I that's think good to know we've only been dealing with this for, you know, a treatment for 30 years. Right. Um, yeah. And anytime you do, you know, they didn't see a lot of resistance to penicillin when it first came out either, you right. know, but you, you give things enough time, nature has its way. And yeah, I mean, yeah. that's, that is the, you know, cost is one thing, but you're right. I mean, just putting a horse on a daily pair, you know, it's kind of like Strongid C, you know, where we, we fed that daily dewormer to horses um, most right. horses are pretty, uh, you know, most horse parasites don't respond to that, that drug anymore. You That's know? right. And, and, and so that can occur. Um, it hasn't right now, but it mm -hmm. is a, a concern. And I think any of us, um, veterinarians just always feel that onus to, to not, uh, flood the, the environment with, uh, anti anything um, yeah. because there's a natural balance there. Uh, wow. So we just blew through a whole lot of stuff about like a really, really complex, right? AP complexin. That's the kind it is, but a really <laughs> complex parasite. Uh, Dr. Jason, what are you, what are you doing over there? What are you thinking? I'm contemplating EPM, EPM ish and all kinds of mice without gamma interferon. That's just some really cool stuff. Right. It is. It yeah. is. I can't believe that, uh, that all that kind of well, stuff. We did. We, co we covered, we covered um, you know, not everything, uh, yeah. but all the important stuff for everyone, everyone to know and be aware of, uh, sort of touching on the resistance situation. Cause that sort of needs to be in the back of everyone's mind about everything, not just, EPM. Yeah. um, right. but you give something enough times to enough, enough, uh, animals, the, mm -hmm. the bug is going to fight back a little bit. I mean, so. shameless plug for our episode with, uh, the very brainy, um, Dr. Laurel Redding, where we talk about antimicrobial resistance right. and the mechanisms right. by which it develops. So check that out. Um, if you want to know more, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, we, we just got through an entire convo about horses and we didn't mention the word gut or colic or, <laughs> A single time. <laughs> That's like a gold star. We didn't star. mention gut. We just we, we didn't mention colic though. We did mention gut and how, how good it is for the immune system. So oh, that's true. That's, that's right. true. I stand corrected. I was listening. I may not have been participating because I was enthralled in y'all's discussion, but I was absolutely <laughs> listening. Well, okay. You know, and, and, and there are a host of things I would be remiss not to mention. You know that that there are a host of things that people are going to find out there. Um, 
you know, and even some of them sound very scientifically credible. Mm -hmm. Um, I really encourage people to trust their, their, um, general practitioner or, Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes the EPM will go into a, uh, into an internal medicine specialist like myself and, and to, and to value theirs. There, there are some complementary treatments that I think, you know, a lot of times these are neurological rehabilitation cases and they need to have that rehabilitation mindset. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think using some traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture, you know, those can be ancillary things that can be beneficial whenever you have nerve damage, uh, damage to the central nervous system. So those should be um, keyed on. I I would also like to mention that these uh, anti-protozoal medications do have a natural sort of growth promoting what we call a blooming effect on horses. And uh, they have gotten very popular to use and horses um, that are thought to have these very mild cases of EPM, I don't think that they have mild cases of EPM at all, but you will, you will hear around the barns, you will see with certain trainers, they will, in certain areas I've been, I mean, a, a, an entire barn of horses will go through a month of these medications before a big show in order to kind of clean them out. But they do have a, you know, when they're used in cattle, you see a, uh, their daily gain go up. You see some other mm-hmm. effects that are not related to them uh, killing sarcosis neurona. So um, these horses do look better after going on treatment, mm-hmm. but just realize that that is likely a drug effect that is not, um, germane to killing EPM. EPM. Well, I'm sure like all of those are effective against other like gastrointestinal parasites that may mm -hmm. be at a low level and totally subclinical, but they are kind of hampering the horse's overall condition. And so sure, if you eliminate those, okay, everyone looks better. (laughs) <laughs> yep. Right. They do. They, they yeah. look a lot better. And, you know, a lot of times people go, see, I told you that thing had EPM. Well, you know, to your point, Jen, they, they can have some other benefits. So mm-hmm. just, just want to have full point. optics on that. When people, yeah. people see, see, or hear that around the barn, that's, yeah. that's very common. That's a very good point. That's a very good point and well taken. Um, so yeah. Um, Dr. Jason, anything else? No, I think I'm an EPM expert now. I'm ready to roll. <laughs> Uh, all right. Now, if we can just figure out how to cling better to the horse when riding it, um, Dr. Franklin, uh, thank you so much for joining us. This has been wonderful. Um, do you have any places that you like to send folks that are credible and reliable? Um, you share those with us and we'll throw those into the show notes if you like, um, so that people can get more information, um, you know, on this disease itself. Or they can just watch this uh, podcast or listen to it over and over and over over again. Pretty much. Right? That's right. That's right. I mean, we we wouldn't hate that. That's for sure. But yeah, give us some reason. People love to go places. So we'll we'll put those in the show notes for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I think that's all we have on our uh, equine episode today. Um, Yeah. So I'm Dr. Jen the Vet. And I'm Dr. Jason. And we'll see you guys on the next episode. This episode is sponsored by Full Bucket Veterinary Strength Supplements. Use promo code CHATFIELDS to receive 20% off your first order from Full Bucket Veterinary Strength Supplements.